You see my difficulty, Your Excellency. I wonder if you shouted left, right or something. Might that not help them keep in step? Only the ones that know their left from their right. The quality of men I hope for is not volunteer. Am I supposed to make a campaign in the wilderness with such men as these? Well, Lieutenant Colonel Washington, it's either these men or no men at all. The House of Burgesses has not yet voted me the power to conjure men from thin air. Are you saying you cannot do it? Not at all. If you send me the proper supplies, and if we can begin cutting a road soon enough this spring, and if I have enough artillery to withstand attack, then I can hold the forks of the Ohio against the French and however many Indians they bring, provided they don't bring too many. You have fenced yourself with ifs, Colonel. Do you march out to failure or to victory? I march to victory. But if you don't send us supplies quickly enough, we can't go far. Soldiers tend to get discouraged by the third day without food. You'll have your supplies. Then you'll have your victory. I can't help wishing you had had some experience in battle. Your Excellency, not a living soul has any experience at all in actual battle with Indians who are under French command. I can't find a single book on such warfare. Well then, you shall have to write one, won't you? Washington. Here I am. Captain Trench sent me. He, he begs you to come quickly. He expects to be attacked at any moment. You see the fine road we have? You see how many wagons we have? Ten. Only ten wagons and no cannon at all. The House of Burgesses is full of fine talk about war, but when it comes to sending supplies... Well, I suppose ten wagons are better than nothing at all. Nothing is what the government sent. I got the wagons myself in Winchester. Took them away from the local residents. I am not well locked in Winchester. Come on, men. Hurry at your work. The French are gathering at the forks of the Ohio. We must be there soon or it's all for nothing. Give me that axe. That is what hurrying means. Now hurry. Uh, it's too late, sir. The French and Indians just overwhelmed us. The British forces had no choice but to surrender. Uh, what do we do, sir? Press on and attack them anyway? Attack them? When they have the fort and cannon and outnumber us two to one? Then we turn back? No, we can't do that. Uh, but the Indians are watching every move we make, sir. I know that. The Indians have watched us on the road. They watch the French take the fort at the forks of the Ohio. If we turn back now... Every chief from the Carolinas to New York will conclude that the French are the clear winners, and we won't have one tribe willing to stand with us. They probably turned against us anyway by now. Some, no doubt, but not all. We can still recover something from this. We can still go forward to Redstone Creek. There's a trading post there, a place we can hold. It isn't the forts, but it's a post west of the mountains. It will give our Indian allies hope. It could also get us killed. Which would you rather, run the risk of being killed here or wait until the Indians come to Virginia and kill the women and children in their sleep? Is it that simple a choice? We can salvage something from the disaster the legislature forced on us by not sending us supplies, so we will. Mm. They pressed forward. There were rumors of reinforcements behind them, reports of huge armies of French and Indians ahead of them. And finally, Lieutenant Colonel Washington stopped to form a makeshift fort at a place called Great Meadows. He named his trenches and dirt walls Fort Necessity. And then came word that a force of Frenchmen was definitely close by. Half King, you are my trusted friend. What do you advise? Do we hold back and wait for more soldiers, or do we attack at once? They do not know how near we are to them. And I am tired of hearing tales of how only the French know how to win battles. I am for attacking, too. Tomorrow? At dawn. I am with you forever, Colonel Washington. Washington split his little army and came upon the French scouting party from two sides. Regardez. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Là, soldats anglais. Soldats anglais! Regardez! Cachez-vous! Préparez vos fusils! Cachez-vous! Oh, 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 oh,
Get down, Colonel. Don't keep pulling at my coat. How can I see what's going on if I hide my head in the bushes? Actually, there's something charming in the sound of bullets going by. It's the ones that don't go by that worry me. We won, I think. Begin a count of casualties. The Virginians lost only one man, while only one Frenchman escaped alive. The victory was important because it gave the Virginians confidence, but the main French army was still ahead. Washington was delighted when reinforcements arrived. I'm Captain Mackey of the British Army. And I'm Lieutenant Colonel Washington. I'm glad to see you here. We can use some men with discipline and training. We're pushing forward to Redstone, but we're pretty well cutting the road as we go. We'll be glad of more hands at the work. Sir, I'm afraid there's some misunderstanding here. I am a captain of the British Army. Yes. I didn't mistake you for a Frenchman. You have a very lovely rank, but you and your men are militia, and I and my men are regular army. We are not under your command. I see. And as for cutting trees to make roads, that's not our work. How can I expect my men to work all day cutting down trees while your men sit around and watch? Regular army is regular army. When the bullets come at us, will they all come straight to your men? I have wounded soldiers pulling logs out of the way, and your men haven't shed a drop of blood. I've heard enough of this insolence. I am an officer of the British Army, and I will not be reprimanded by a puffed-up officer of a ragtag militia. If we reach Redstone in time, we may win an important victory. If we don't, we may have lost the war before we fairly began. Does that make no difference to you? Uh, I see no point in further conversation on this matter. I shall use uh, that wagon as my quarters. You shall not, sir. That wagon belongs to the ragtag militia. If we are not in this together, Captain Mackey, you will have to pitch your own tent upon ground you have cleared yourself. Mackey's men were worse than useless, and Washington got rid of them by leaving them behind at Fort Necessity, while the Virginia regiment pressed on into the forest alone. Then Governor Dinwiddie sent word that no cannon would be coming after all. Scouts reported that the French were nearby in overwhelming force. Without cannon, without more men, without supplies, without a decent fort, it would be pointless suicide. We have no choice but to retreat. Better to retreat than to let the French claim a decisive victory by destroying us. I'm with you on that, sir. So, English have no stomach for battle. I thought you were a brave man, Colonel Washington. Half King, fighting wouldn't mean anything. Why die for nothing? You are coward, not man. I never a friend of English again. Trust the Indians to let us down with his tough. Don't say a word against him. When we're gone, his people will still be on this side of the mountains, with the French and all their Indian allies against them. I do the same thing in his place, I think. Washington's little regiment got back to Fort Necessity with the French right behind them. All day, the French and Indians, hidden behind trees, poured a storm of bullets into the camp. We must form ranks and charge them. Break through their line. Don't be a fool, Captain Mackey. They don't have a line. They'll let you attack anywhere you like in your neat little rows of soldiers, and they'll fall back in front of you, let you get deeper and deeper into the forest, and pick you off one by one from behind the trees. Don't try to teach me about commanding troops in battle. Captain Mackey. Have you seen a single one of the Indians firing at us? Do you even know where they are? No. There isn't the slightest possibility of our getting out of here alive. And there is no purpose to be served in continuing to fight. I see that. At the same time, they can't force us out by open attack because we'd slaughter them crossing the meadow. And if they have to wait days and days for a siege, their Indians will start getting difficult. 
I think we can negotiate a settlement. I don't speak French. Neither do I. Oh, well, raise the white flag, and I think they'll get the idea. So George Washington's first military command ended in defeat. It was not his fault, and in fact he had done a brilliant job of keeping his untrained men together during their retreat through the forest. But defeat was defeat. George Washington resigned his commission and went back to Mount Vernon to farm. They're sending General Braddock and an army to take Fort Duquesne. What's that to me, Will? Come on, George. You're dying to go with them. My military career is over. Why? Because the fools who wouldn't send you supplies want to blame it all on you? I have it on the best authority that the governor is sorry for what he said about you, George. <laughs> I know he is. I was offered my commission again. There, you see? I turned it down. You don't fool me, George. You'll be with Braddock's army. And he was. Braddock no sooner arrived in America than he insisted on having George Washington as his personal aide. Washington began almost at once, acting as Braddock's deputy to the House of Burgess as the British Army made its way up the Potomac, heading for the very road that Washington had cut through the forest. And this time, it wasn't just a Virginian expedition. This time, all the colonies were required to send troops. But instead of troops, Pennsylvania sent Benjamin Franklin. With the size of our force, we'll make short work of Fort Duquesne. Then I am to proceed to Niagara, and having taken that to Frontenac. If there's time enough in the season, General Braddock. I can't think of why there wouldn't be, Mr. Franklin. Fort Duquesne can't possibly take my force more than three or four days at the most. <laughs> That's why we're so glad to have you here in America, General Braddock. Until you came, that fort had us worried. We kept thinking of the fact that an army the size of yours would be strung out in a line four miles long through deep forest. The savages are quite good at laying ambushes. They could cut apart an army pretty quickly that way, armed with French muskets. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no doubt they could chop up your raw colonial militia fast enough. The king's regular and disciplined troops take such an attack without even breaking formation. I'm sure they will. After all, your troops have withstood the most terrible parade grounds of Europe. Mm. My men can keep their perfect lines in mud or rough terrain. I do hope they step aside now and then for the trees. Yeah. Well, I've seen the forest. It, uh, it looks a bit rough. I beg your pardon, but you haven't seen the forest. You've merely seen patches of woods between cleared fields. The forest is ahead. You know, our militiamen have found that marching in lines leads to neat rows of bodies waiting for burial. Yes. And I have found that strict discipline is the only way an army stays alive. To the point. Pennsylvania sent an army. Right. To the point, then. Which would you rather have? An army the size of the one you have now, with a hundred wagons full of provisions, or an army the size of the one you have now, with no provisions at all? I want the provisions. And I want the troops from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, alas, is owned outright by a Quaker family. I assure you they would rather die than go to war. They are a peaceful people. I know this because they nearly killed me for trying to raise an army. <laughs> I see that. But I did prevail upon them to send provisions. And those provisions are already on the way. Mm. But I need men. You'll do well enough with the Virginians. Young Major Washington hasn't done much on attack, but I understand he's a marvel when it comes to retreating. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, he'll have no need for that skill. Well, it seems that young George has arrived from Williamsburg. So I hear, but his friends can't make up their mind whether he's a general or colonel or major. In fact, that's a puzzle. He wouldn't take the commission unless he was at least a general, though in fact he should be a major. 
I'm only glad that I didn't have to crown him king. Sometimes he thinks he is a king. General Braddock, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, George. Mr. Franklin, this is my aide, General Washington. George, that is. This is Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia. Mr. Franklin, the man who wants to see Delaware and Rhode Island giving orders to Virginia and New York. <laughs> and you must be the hero of the famous victory at Fort Necessity. <laughs> I assume you're here because Pennsylvania has decided to send words instead of troops. We heard that you were coming and all of our troops said, with George Washington there, they don't need us. He can whip the French and the Indians by himself. Good day to you, General Braddock. And when the supplies arrive, you'll find a little token of our respect for you and the other officers of the British Army. Yes, and may God protect you on your journey home. And you too. Don't count too heavily on getting any supplies from the Pennsylvanians. They're all talk, no action. Really? I was going to say that Benjamin Franklin is the first cultured, educated man I've met in America. The only fly I've seen him is that he believes all this nonsense about fighting behind trees. <laughs> Does he? That's the first time I heard of him having any sense. Mm. In my army, George, the soldiers are disciplined. They do not break ranks. If you start breaking ranks, you might as well sound retreat. Because without the security of a man on the left of you and a man on the right they of you... They won't do you much good when there are Indians in front and behind, shooting from bushes where you can't see them. I'll hear no more of that argument. I am a trained officer with years of experience in battle, sir. You, you are a farmer with friends in the House of Burgesses. If you won't listen to men who know the country... I have listened to all that I intend to hear. Is that clear? Ah, tell me what Governor Dinwiddie has to say. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, hey. Ben Franklin's wagons arrived, and General Braddock's army moved forward into the forest. They reached their own Fort Tumberland and then went on. But the weather and disease were beginning to hamper them. Is this what it's like here every summer? <laughs> we're, we're in the mountains. It's cooler here. Every day at noon, I pray for a cloud. One single cloud hanging in the air between us and the sun. If Moses got one, why can't we? <laughs> How are you doing? Much better, sir. Much better. Look at you. Half dead with dysentery. If there's anything worse than dysentery, you can't even brag about it afterwards to your friends. Sir, you can't let me miss the battle. Well... Then get better quickly. I am leaving you here with several men. Dunbar will be along soon with half of the army and the wagons. He'll bring you along while I take the rest of the troops forward against the French. Take me with you. When you're sick, you have to ride in the wagon. I, I'm better. I, I'm, I'm much better already, sir. Lie down. Lie down. I'm having a hard enough time keeping the men's morale up with this heat of this disease without having you die in a saddle right before their very eyes. Sir! What is it? <clears throat> I've argued with you often. Yes. But I have to tell you, I admire you greatly, sir. I I've never seen a man better in control of his troops without resorting to cruelty. Don't get, don't get maudlin, sir. You'll get better pretty soon. And then you'll regret all the nice things you said. <laughs> Just don't waste so much time building bridges over every brook. Yes. That's my Colonel Washington. And watch out for ambush near the fords of the Monongahela. If we let him reach the fort, his superior number may be too much for us. Let me go now and take him at the fords of the Monongahela. We, oui. we. Oui, that is the right place, Beaujeu. But if you see that you are getting the worst of it, come back quickly. And Beaujeu, if you win, let the Indian have the prisoner. I will torture them, sir. Burn them alive. We must let the Anglais know what will happen to any army that comes against us. Colonel Washington, what are you doing? 
I'm going forward to rejoin General Braddock. You're a fool, man. You're sick as a dog. That's a good enough excuse to stay in a wagon. Dunbar, I'm not looking for excuses to stay in a wagon. Washington sat on horseback above the fords of the Monongahela and watched as Braddock's army crossed the river in exact lines. Isn't that a beautiful sight, Washington? An army to be proud of. Such, such good men. All of them. I can't help thinking that to the enemy they look like rows of perfect targets waiting to be picked off one by one. I'd hope that dysentery would cure you of your quarrelsome disposition. Oh, well. The Virginians love you, and uh, that keeps them under control. Even if they are more rabble and soldiers. They got safely over both fords because Beaujeu's army of French and Indians were still racing toward them from Fort Duquesne. It was not an ambush. The two armies collided miles from where they thought to meet. They surprised each other. Come on, get your backs into it. Are we making a road or are we making little wood carvings? Somebody's coming. Hey, Angle! Angle! The French. Get your muskets. Sorry. Ha! Got him. Looked like a French officer. Reload and fire. That's it! Fall <laughs> back, line up, come on, load and fire as you go into position. Fire what? I don't see anybody. Fall back, line up, that's right! Quickly, get the men drawn forward into their battle formation. Sir, not in formation. The enemy is hiding in the trees. There's no open country here. I once let the men break ranks, they lose all discipline. At least let me have my Virginians. They are the least disciplined troops. They, above all, must remain in the correct order. Dismissed, Colonel Washington. I don't see anybody. Fire! I can't! I can't! Stay low. That's right, stay low. The general says to form up a line. But hold your place, men. Show them what Virginians are made of. How can we fight an enemy we can't see? Form up there. Shoot all deserters. Any man running tight behind a tree will be shot. Do you hear me? General Braddock's down, Colonel Washington. He said for you to take command. All right, men. Take cover behind the trees and lay down fire to protect our retreat. Sound the retreat! Washington performed a miracle. Even though the British Army was cut to pieces, he managed to hold them in order and lead them back to safety. The dying General Braddock lived long enough for them to reach Dunbar's army. If only, if only, if only our men had been able to, to keep better order. It was a defeat, but Washington emerged as the hero who kept it from being an utter disgrace and the Virginia militia was willing to follow him anywhere. There were some lessons learned. How to fight on American terrain, the superiority of native-born troops in wilderness battle, and above all, this lesson. George Washington was the American commander. For the next few years, he kept up a constant struggle, trying to protect the frontier against the Indians without proper supplies or trained soldiers. It was good practice for what lay ahead of him he found out just how much he could accomplish with almost nothing. Governor Dinwiddie, the only thing I've accomplished is brilliant retreats. Keep on retreating like that, George, and someday you might just win.
I'm 16 years old, Mother. I was there when you were born, George. I'm quite aware of your age. Look at the water. With the boat skimming the surface, down the Potomac to Chesapeake Bay, and out the Chesapeake into the ocean, how can you keep me at home when I could go out to sea and become somebody? It is not the sea that looks beautiful to you, George. It's the shore. The sea itself without land nearby is very dull. Just look at the waves and a few ill-tempered birds and sailors, sailors, sailors. <laughs> if you feel confined in Virginia, think how you'll feel in a ship that's smaller than your brother Lawrence's house. So I'm to stay at home no matter what I want. Not at all, George. Any time you want to, you can run away from home and become a common sailor on the nearest ship. You're tall and strong. I, I have no doubt they take you. A common sailor? Of course. I'll be an officer, Mother, or I won't go. I'm not just a pair of arms to pull in the sail. I've got a mind. I've worked all my life, studied and trained myself to be... To be... To be a great man. Yes. <sighs> And great men stay at home and tend great estates. When your roots are secure in the land, George, then you can go look for whatever you want. Uh, tell the truth now. You enjoy surveying, don't you? Mm. No. Don't lie to your mother. I'm not lying. I never lie. I don't like surveying. <laughs> but I do like drawing maps. I'll tell you something, Mother. Sometimes... I look at the forest and think of it as an ocean where we have to go one by one under the green waves. And when I draw a map that puts a river in its place and marks a hill, well, I'm like Magellan or Balboa, marking the way for other Virginians to come after me. Englishman, you mean? <laughs> I haven't met an Englishman who could find the dog that was biting him without a map. <laughs> George, you are an Englishman. Not I. When did I ever see England in my life? A land of fops and dandies. Well, I never thought to hear my son say that. And when I know this land, I'll have this land. Not the Indians, not the mountains, not the rivers. Nothing will stand in my way. It's a world, and I mean to have it. <laughs> Surely not all of it. Until civilized men have all the land, we don't truly own any of it. Don't you realize, Mother, the Indians could... Come here any night they chose and cut our throats in our beds? <laughs> That's why I love to talk to you, George. You're always so cheerful. <laughs> well, if you won't let me go to sea, I'll become a soldier. I will not permit you to be killed in battle. Oh, good. Well, I'll just tell that to the enemy, and they'll retreat rather than get your dander up. <laughs> now, George, I'm leaving you here at Mount Vernon to live with your half-brother, Lawrence. Now, try to remember that neither your late father's fortune nor your elder brother's generosity will last forever. Try not to drain either one too quickly. Oh, Laurie and I get along brilliantly. That's what I fear the most. Now, study hard and prepare yourself to run an estate. Only a man who can properly govern his own lands is fit to govern a nation. Govern a nation? It's what your father always used to say as he cursed the fools and the house of Burgesses. <laughs> yes, I remember. A nation. Father always said a colony. Colony, nation. What's the difference? Ben Franklin calls us a nation now. That's all. Oh, does he know? He's from Philadelphia. Do well here, George. I'll pray for you every day, many times, every day. I won't disappoint you, Mother. I know you never will. <laughs> another, George, another. <laughs> well, well, Lord Fairfax, I only know a few stories. <laughs> true ones, anyway. <laughs> I know a few enough men who worry about whether a story is true. <laughs> You know these woods, George Washington, and uh, you know these Indians. And you have a good mind. Lord Fairfax, you do me too much on Ah, nonsense. I got to be as old, mean-spirited and rich as I am 
because I am an excellent judge of character. I know a scoundrel when I see one, but any man can do that, as well as any man can recognize dirt. But gold, <laughs> I know gold when I see it. George, I have a project. Your brother Lawrence and I and a few others are trying to develop a consortium to buy Western land and open up a colony beyond the Appalachians in the Ohio Valley. A new colony in the Indian lands? They're not using the land, but it requires a royal charter, and, uh, and we have to wait. Still, we don't have to sleep while we're waiting. I need young and vigorous men, George, who know that Western country, who can survey land. Who can plan roads? Roads? Well, I know how to lay out roads and how to build them, too. A road through the mountains to the Ohio Valley. I'm your man, Lord Fairfax. <laughs> Bide your time. Bide your time, George. We'll begin small. I own most of the Shenandoah Valley, and I understand there are settlers moving in and taking up farming on my land. I need a complete survey so I can evict the trespassers. Is that a job you can accomplish, George? Who will you send with me? My nephew, Will. We can do it. Can you do it without getting killed by Indians? <laughs> the Indians don't scare me half as much as the settlers do. Surveyors won't be popular out there. <laughs> well, who would imagine that Lord Fairfax would send 16-year-old boys on such a dangerous mission? <laughs> 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 Is this where we'd cut a road, George? Well, I'm not sure, Will. The fording of that stream was too steep for wagons. There'll have to be a shift from this trail to a better ford somewhere else on the river. Upstream, I imagine. Look! Smoke! Well, that'll be Winchester. Come on, come on, boy. You seem to be fascinated with our visitors, Mr. Washington. I am, Mr. Crasip. I admit it. They dance like animals, but their drums are cleverly made. Are they really savages? They are savage, Mr. Washington, when they go to war. They seem to love the sound of their enemy's pain. They laugh as they flay a man alive or burn him to death. I wouldn't be surprised if these very men who now dance here within our stockade had, had at some time killed an Englishman or captured a child or taken a settler's wife against her will. And you let him visit with you? Of course. I like them to look up at my cannon, at my sturdy walls. I want them to be my friends. <laughs> what kind of friend is it that you make through fear? When it comes to dealings among nations, Mr. Fairfax, fear is the only basis for peace. Either you fear each other, or you both fear someone else. This tribe needs our friendship to strengthen them against another tribe. Well, why should we help them? Let the Indians kill each other, I say. If we don't help them, the French will. And the Indians that the French help will certainly win. And then where are we? The strongest tribes will be the friends of the French. And we are lost. Very good, Mr. Washington. Only don't say it so loudly. Officially, we're not at war with France. England is always at war with France, whether anyone admits it or not. But we fight the war by giving weapons to our Indian allies. You speak as if these savages were nations. They are. Never forget that for an instant if you mean to survive here in this wilderness. The Indians are nations, and they are every bit as clever in war and diplomacy as Europeans. They don't wear crowns, and their geometry is weak. But when you deal with a chief, always remember that he speaks for a nation just as the king himself does. Ten muskets with gunpowder and shot means that they will be able to, well, kill enough game to get through the winter. And so they will be your friends for those ten muskets betray you to someone else for 15. How is that different from the Christian kings of Europe, who trade a seaport for a county, fishing rights for dropping a tariff? First, a king must benefit his people, or soon he will not be a king. The chiefs know that as well as any king. <laughs> I just can't quite bring myself to think of these creatures as men. I count their arms and legs, and they look like men to me. While George Washington was learning his way among the people and the forest of the mountains, 
Farther west, the English trappers were already ranging to the Great Lakes and beyond to the Mississippi, all to get the furs that would warm the gentlemen and ladies of Europe. But with French colonies in Canada and New Orleans, the English would not be alone for long in the great midlands of North America. Stop. Uh, who said? Look at his green jacket there. It's a frog. Hey, what you doing here? You will all please wait. We will all please keep right on going. Giddy up, donkey. Seeing as, as how you all invited us so nice, we all be pleased to wait right here. There must be 30 of them. We're 500 miles from Canada. <laughs> Maybe they got lost. Yeah, when you got frogs down this far south, it's trouble. No wonder we ain't been seeing no engines. That is right, my friend. The Indians in this country have learned that the Anglia King is their enemy, while the governor of Canada is their friend. So far as I've heard, there ain't no war on between you and us. There is always a war between the landlord and the trespasser. Trespasser? We, oui. we. Oui. This land is now French land, and you are trespasser. Twenty years I've been trapping this land. And you tell me that all this time these Indians been speaking French? This land has been claimed for France, the name of His Majesty. Well, you go tell His Majesty that if he want this here land, he better come out here himself and fight me for it. And if he fights me, he can look to lose his eyes and nose at least before I let him go. Enough. This is French land, and I order you to leave and not come back. You will not trap on this land, you will not travel through this land, or you will be shot. We'll be right pleased to do just as you say, Mr. Frenchman, sir. In a pig's eye. If you would care to count the loaded muskets in our immediate proximity, I think you will find that France owns every bit of land around here that these boys say she owns. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this all here looks like French land to me, too. Now, if you'll excuse us, we'll just head on back to Virginia. Not so fast. Have you paid your tax? I'm sure we did. Yes, for sure, our taxes are all paid up. Half your foes, right now, donkeys and all. Tie them and turn them over to us. If you think for one minute I'm going to cause you any trouble, you're dead wrong. I was just thinking how it wasn't fair for us to use these fine highways you built through here uh, without paying our fair share to build them. Cut them donkeys loose. Wait till they hear about this in Williamsburg. And what will they do about it? Well, if the fur trade goes, Virginia loses a lot of money. And if all the Indians go over to the French, there'll be houses burning all over the colonies. There'll be a war over it, you can bet your life. Lori! Laurie! Hush, George. Oh, hush. Laurie isn't feeling well at all today. Laurie! Laurie! George, must you make so infernally much noise? I came direct from Lord Fairfax. The French have sent an army through the whole Ohio Valley. They built a fort on the south shore of Lake Erie, and they're forcing our trappers to lead the country. Oh, there's sure to be a war. Here I am, probably dying of some wretched disease. Don't talk that way, Laurie. George, see how you've upset him? I must be sensible. I, I must. The air here is only making me worse and worse. I must leave Virginia and get better. <coughs> I'll never make it through another winter. Barbados. What do you say, George? We'll sell to Barbados. Barbados? The war will be here. Oh, don't be absurd, George. There won't be a war this year. <coughs> the new governor is coming from London, and the old one isn't going to start anything. <coughs> Campaigns take time. <coughs> time in which I must cure myself of this... <coughs> Barbados it is, then. Am I to stay here? 
Oh, I'll send for you immediately. I'm established there. Uh, you must tie up loose ends. I'll, I'll leave at once. And me? Come with me, George, and in exchange, I'll give you a letter of introduction to Governor Dinwiddie when he gets here. If there's to be a war, I can't think of a reason why you shouldn't be an officer. <laughs> After all, I do know the West Country as well as any man. And your father was a noted soldier. <coughs> Besides which, you look splendid on a horse, which always impresses them in Williamsburg. So, <coughs> so tell the servants that we're packing to leave, and George, see about getting me aboard the next ship bound for the Indies. There it is, Lawrence. Is it the promised land? Oh, it's a filthy colony teeming with slaves. Look at it. A land so lush that you can live well without even working, and they're, <coughs> they're so deep in debt that they can hardly survive. Bad management. The West Indies colonies don't have any decent government. <coughs> Oh, George, I don't know if this voyage has done me any good. I'm worse now than I was in Virginia. You'll get better. I may die just thinking about this harbor. Chaos. <laughs> Everybody wants to have a harbor master's salary, but nobody wants to do the work the good harbor master has to do. <coughs> Study how they do things here. Study the disorganization, the laziness, the dishonesty, the corruption, the cowardice, the incompetence. <coughs> That's what will happen in Virginia if good men aren't kept in government. The new governor, Dinwood, <coughs> he's an excellent man. Oh, George, I wish I could see you and him together. You will. I'm dying, George. <coughs> I'm weak now. Right to the bones, I'm weak. Don't talk like that. I was going to change the world. I was going to create a new colony in the West. <coughs> new lands and a fresh start. A nation. That's what I had in mind. A model for how all of England's lands ought to be governed. <coughs> Good government is the noblest enterprise in the world, George. I'm going to be a soldier, not a governor. Don't you know? The whole key to being a good soldier is good government. <laughs> Barbados was a failure. Lawrence did not get any better, and George came down with smallpox. For a month, he was on the brink of death. Oh, Mr. George, sir... Is it morning? You'll be awake. Might, might I have some breakfast? Or, or lunch, depending on what time it is. You'll be alive. Yes, I'm alive. Perhaps God means me to accomplish something with my life after all. When they could travel, Lawrence set out for Bermuda, and George returned to Virginia to bring Laurie's wife to him. George arrived in Williamsburg, Virginia, with a letter for Governor Dinwiddie. To tell you the truth, Mr. Washington, I'd already heard of you. I've seen your maps of the western country. I have an eye for an artist, and you are an artist. But more important, those who have used your maps tell me they are unusually accurate. I try to do them well, Governor Dinwiddie. I must admit, you don't look as I thought you would. Most young men your age wear bright clothing to attract women, the way flowers wear bright petals to attract bees. Those fashions have never pleased me. I like plain clothing. I will speak plainly with you. France and England are the two great powers of the world. War is coming. But the battlefield will be here and in India and in the Indies, wherever the fleur-de-lis and the Union Jack wave too close together. The French know it. They're preparing for it. And I'm working to persuade England to prepare also. I need men I can trust to help me make sure that it is Virginians who settled the Ohio Valley and not Frenchmen. Are you the sort of man I can count on? If God grants me life, I am. Good. Come see me again when you get back from Bermuda. 
But George never went to Bermuda. A letter arrived from Lawrence first. He says not come, George. It's no use. He's coming home. Coming home? But then he's, he's better. Coming home to die. He wants to die in Virginia. <laughs> Lawrence died in July 1752. His young widow remarried within a few years and sold George her life interest in the Mount Vernon estate. George took control and soon had the plantation prospering. Then came a summons from the governor. There you are, Major Washington. This time I send you into the wilderness with only a few companions. Next time I'll send you with an army. However you send me, Your Excellency, you will not regret your trust in me. Major Washington, we've had snow up to our ears for a week. I'm even taller than I thought, apparently. It's only up to my knees. Can't we turn back, sir? The governor can't blame us for the weather. He can blame us for letting the weather stop us. We have a message for the French commander at Fort LeBeuf. I can't go on. You're welcome to stop and spend... Wherever you like. I'll die if I stop. Then I suggest you keep going. We send many more with you. That is enough. Most impressive. Your troops are very well disciplined. My uh, little army is unhealthy. A, a wisp of air. That is why it grieves me so much to tell you that we cannot obey your governor a uh, windy deep. Dinwiddie. We cannot obey his request to withdraw from this land. You must understand. I myself would rather be in Paris. Why should we quarrel? Let me give you some wine for this evening. Since you are so certain, you must leave tomorrow. We won't need the wine. We must rise early in the morning. Good evening to you, Commander Saint-Pierre. And to you. He's the slimiest Frenchman I've ever seen. And I've seen some slimy ones. He's also clever, Mr. Gist. He hasn't been able to get us or our Indians drunk. He doesn't want us drunk. He just wants us to leave here without half-king. You don't think he plans to violate the truce and kill us? No, Mr. Gist. It's all politics. He wants all the Indians in the Ohio Valley to think that no Indians are fighting on the English side. If we leave here without our Indians, all his allies will think we are too weak to keep any friends. But they'll think twice about their alliance with France if they see we have powerful tribes with us. We're all right then, aren't we? Half King isn't drinking tonight. Saint Pierre will think of something else. You pick a fine morning to leave. The air is clear. The sun is shining. Where is Half King, Saint Pierre? What? Am I supposed to watch your Indians for you? Not at all, my friend. Half King will come. Are you afraid to travel the wilderness without him? I'll gladly send some of my men to escort you back to Virginia, if you like. No, thank you. Major Washington. We're waiting for you, Half King. Oh, I know. I am sorry. I can't go with you. I'm not ready to go. What did Saint-Pierre give you to persuade you to stay here? Four guns, gunpowder, blankets. If we stay just one more day, winter is long, and my people need these things. Very well. Take the gifts and stay one more day. I'll simply wait for you. Ah, Saint-Pierre did not think you would wait. Saint-Pierre doesn't know me. But I know you. I like you, Major. George Washington returned to Virginia with his Indians and made his report to the governor. 
He refused. I thought he would. But one must make every effort to keep the peace, mustn't one? War, then? Why don't you write a full report of your expedition, Major? I'll present it to the House of Burgesses tomorrow and send it to the King's Council in England at once. Write my whole report in one day? And do a brilliant job of it, too, Major. We must convince them that the French are dangerous and bent on mischief. We must persuade them to send us an army. 